course, before um, we get started, I needed to you know, mention our supporting organizations for today. So the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare uh, Improvement is here today. Uh, Connie C. G. Yama is, should be here. Um, and then uh, LBCG Consulting, Steve Lowe, I think, is in the audience. I did see him. Uh, and then Health Pro, there's a number of them here. Jennifer Potvin is here this morning as well. And uh, Hirok with uh, Catherine Galton, and Catherine's over there. Uh, and, and then, of course, Women's College Hospital for this morning. A uh, big thank you to Women's College Hospital. And to welcome our uh, speaker this morning, we have Heather McNeil. <coughs> Heather. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. What began as a desire to help those in need has evolved into a mission to improve the quality of health care for all Canadians. Chris Power's journey in health care began at the bedside as a frontline nurse. Since then, she has grown into one of the preeminent healthcare executives in Canada. Her experiences, her success, and her values have led her to the position of CEO of the Canadian Patient Safety Institute. Previously, Chris served for eight years as president and CEO of Capital Health in Nova Scotia. Chris holds a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Mount St. Vincent University and a Master's in Health Services Administration from Dalhousie University. <coughs> She's a certified health executive with the Canadian College of Health Services Executives and holds a fellowship in the management for executive nurses from the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania. In 2003, she received the Award for Excellence in Innovation from the Canadian College of Health Services Executives and in 2007 received an Award of Excellence from the Halifax Progress Club. She was named one of Canada's top 100 most powerful women in the public sector category three years in a row from 2007, from 2009, and in 2010 was inducted into the Hall of Fame. She was named one of the top 50 CEOs in Atlantic Canada four times and in 2013 was inducted into the top 50 CEOs Hall of Fame. In 2013, Chris received an honorary doctorate in civil law from St. Mary's University. Chris holds significant governance roles, including President of the Canadian Association for Health Services and Policy Research Board, Co-Chair of CHLNet, Board Member of Colleges and Institutes of Canada, and Board Member of Simulation Canada. With all the accolades and responsibilities, Chris has maintained her strong sense of self and credits her love of family, faith, and her gift of singing for keeping her grounded. It's my pleasure to welcome Chris Power. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for that uh, introduction, Heather. I'm really delighted to be here with you today. I apologize up front. I have a horrible cold, so I will try to not cough and disrupt or blow my nose too much or any of those things, but I'm really thrilled to be here to share with you the, the journey that we've been on at the Canadian Patient Safety Institute. This is a bit of a retrospective, a bit of looking in the rearview mirror, because <coughs> we are thrilled to have worked with Longwoods to produce a special edition of the journey that we took on the National Patient Safety um, Consortium that took place from 2014 to, uh, we wrapped it up in, in, the, uh, in 2018. So to tell you what we've learned along that journey, how it's informed our work at CPSI and our new strategy moving forward, and then what we can all do to keep ourselves safer in the healthcare system and contribute to a safe system. I, often when I talk, I talk about how bad things are, and so I want to just say up front, our work is to improve the rate of harm, to make care safer, but I don't want to forget all the wonderful things that happen every single day in healthcare because they are many, and most of the time we do get it right. And so we need to congratulate ourselves for that, but also not rest on those laurels because way too often we get it wrong. And so that's our work and the journey that we've been on um, as we go forward. Um, <clears throat> I think there are some slides prior to this. Eh? Yeah, yeah, okay. Let me just bring it back to the front here. Here we go. 
Okay. So where did, we, where did this all start? So way back in 1999, there was a report that came out. Some of you may remember that. It was called Air is Human. The Institute of Medicine from the United States published that report. And it was really a view of the healthcare system and how safe it was or not in the United States. And it was pretty alarming what came out of that report. And so there were a group of very interested people in Canada who were in the patient safety space who said, you know, if that's happening in the United States, we know we see what's happening in Canada, but we haven't been able to quantify it. We don't know exactly what that's all about. So they came together as an advisory committee and there were organizations like the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons, the Canadian Nurses Association, Accreditation Canada, many people who were gurus in the patient safety field in those early days came together and really studied it to say what do we need in Canada to really start to make a difference and start to collectively look at the patient safety world that's in front of us and their number so they they had a, a number of recommendations that went to the federal minister of health Anne McClellan at the time and their number one recommendation was that there would be a creation of the Canadian Patient Safety Institute who would have the mandate to really um, work on improvement in patient safety, to develop tools and resources, to really help the country to coalesce around, uh, around patient safety. And so the Minister of Health agreed that this was important to do, and so CPSI was formed in 2003. We are a small organization. We are less than $8 million. Our funding has not changed for the whole time since 2003, so each year it's progressively less. We're only 37 strong in our staffing, but we work with hundreds of partners and experts in patient safety around this country and internationally to really move the bar on patient safety. And so that's how we got our origin. One of the uh, pieces in the mandate at the very onset of, patient, of, of CPSI was to create um, a national patient safety strategy. And so um, in 2013, the, prior to my coming to CPSI, I didn't come until 2015, the organization and the board put together a strategic plan and part of their strategy was to create that national patient safety strategy. And um, so they thought long and hard about what would be the best way to do that and realized that this wasn't one organization's work, that they needed to really bring together people from all across this country who had an interest in patient safety and start to put their heads together to see how we could create that strategy together and how we could execute on it. Because, you know, we've all been involved with creating strategies that have sat on shelves or really didn't get legs. They started out and then they didn't go anywhere. And so CPSI called together about 40 different organizations, many people from, um, from the pan-Canadian health organizations, from regulatory bodies, from provinces and territories at the deputy minister level or assistant deputy minister, the, the real stars in patient safety around the country. They pulled together all of these organizations. Um, HEROC, many of you who are in the room participated in that work and um, pulled them together and said, would this be a good idea? Do you think that this makes sense if we all came together? Could we go faster and, and stronger if we were together in this work? And people, in, the majority of people in the room said, yep, seems like a good idea. Some said, you know, we're not opposed to the idea, but we have our own strategies. We've got our own work. We don't have space for this right now. We'll watch with interest from the sidelines. CPSI also said to them, you know, our areas are focus, our medication safety, surgical safety, infection prevention, control, and home care. That's where we're focused on for the next five years. Are these areas that make sense to you for us as a, as a collaborative group to focus on? And they said, you know what, they may not be the right four, but they're an important four, so we got to start somewhere, let's go there. And so what we did is we formed a consortium of these folks. As we went along, a number of people knocked on our door and said we want to be part of it. People who we hadn't originally asked to participate and so we welcomed whoever and at the end we had over 40 or 50 organizations and hundreds of people who were engaged in this work. The intention was to create a strategy for patient safety in the country. We don't have one in Canada. As you will know, every province does their own thing. Almost every organization does their own thing. We don't collectively, on a lot of issues, come together as a country to really work on what we're doing. And so we wanted to have some shared goals that people thought were important across the country, work on them, and do something with it. 
The consortium folks told us a few things. They said, first of all, we need somebody to manage this. We need someone to drive it. We need somebody to support and fund part of the work that we're doing. And CPSI, we think you're it. And we were happy to take on that role because this was a major part of our strategy and we wanted to move forward with it. So we became the secretariat for this work. They said to us, we're not interested in just developing a strategy. We're interested in action. So let's not call it a strategy. Let's call it an action plan. And let's, let's hold our feet to the fire that we're going to make a difference and we are really going to do something with this work. And so we were thrilled and said, check on that box, awesome in that moving forward. And partway through the work that we were doing, there became a realization that, you know, those four areas are really important, but we have to start to build capacity and capability in our system. And so we need to focus on patient safety education because everybody agrees that it's important, but not everybody had the knowledge or the tools and resources to really lead the work and to do this work moving forward. So we added a group on patient safety education. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I am, and one thing I do also want to say to you is patients were an integral part of this work. At CPSI, we have a program called Patients for Patient Safety Canada. There are over 70 individuals who have either been harmed by the healthcare system or their loved ones have. Some very catastrophically, many of their loved ones having lost their lives. And they have moved through that trajectory of anger and grief and have come to a place where they just want to make a difference in the work going forward. And so we work in collaboration with them on everything we do. And this consortium was no different. They were at the, every single table, in every single group, on every single action moving forward. And they co-created that work with us. Um, the five questions to ask about medications is something that's been picked up all around the world. It's been translated to 30 different languages, a number of indigenous languages as well, and people all over the world are using this, and that we, we do believe it's making a difference for patients to have the kinds of questions and family members that they can ask their, their physicians when they go in. And I won't go into all of them, but the other one, we're proud of all of this work, but the other one that's had tremendous uptake around the world, and certainly in Canada, is the Patient Safety Culture Bundle for CEOs and for uh, senior leaders. What I had heard from my CEO colleagues around the country is, of course, we want to have safe care in our organization. Of course, we want to have a culture of safety. Many said to me, I don't quite, you know, under the cone of silence, I don't know where to start. Where do I start? How do I sift through this? What are the things I should be looking for? What are the things I should be promoting? So this is a little bit of a checklist, but behind every single one of them, a resource that says, if this is not evident in your organization, here are some tips and tools for how you how can help do that. And again, huge uptake for this around the country. A really busy slide, but just to give you a sense of how this collective impact initiative that, uh, and this was all about collective impact um, of the consortium happened. We had, um, as I mentioned, CPSI was a secretariat. We had an overarching steering committee, which was made up of senior leaders from, from CHI-HI, from Canada Health Infoway, Accreditation Canada, Health Quality Ontario. We had a, a, a um, a representative from the deputy ministers of all of the provinces and territories and we kept them apprised of all of this information as we went forward at all the outputs from this work we had lead groups so of the five areas that we were participating in we had co-leads for all of those and then a team underneath them who were developing the action plan saying these are the actions we think in surgical safety infection prevention control etc will move the bar on patient safety and for every single one of those actions that people identified in their lead groups, we had action teams who were hitting the ground running and really delivering on the actions. When I came to CPSI and staff were debriefing me about, or briefing me, I guess, about uh, the consortium and what work had taken place to date, and they told me that they had 86 actions identify and I just about died and I said seriously people like 86 actions let's do something that's a bit manageable we want to have success in this work and the staff said to me please have faith in the process that we've established. This is what people around the country told us was important. Will we execute on all of them? Maybe not. But let's not start, for, see, yeah, this is not just our work. 
This is collective work that everyone who's engaged in this around the country has said is important. So let's just let the process. And I truly believe that in a year's time, I was going to say to them, I told you so. But I thought, you know what, I'm not going to rock the boat. So I said, OK, all right, I'll sit back, I'll watch this. And I am thrilled to tell you, we whittled it down to 76, not because of me or because of CPSI, but these were, as the action teams looked at them, some of the actions were already being undertaken by different organizations or people, um, or they were dependent on some other things happening, or a realization that this was really boiling the ocean, and in a five-year time span, it wasn't going to happen. So so we, 10 of them came off the table, but as you saw, when we wrapped, tied the bow on this in 2018, every single one of those 76 actions were either underway or completed. And that is unprecedented, we think, and we were just thrilled with, uh, with what happened. We did have an advisory communications group. We had an evaluation team because right from the very beginning we said we need to evaluate this work going forward. And we did. So what were some of the lessons learned in this work that we did? Um, so collaboration for if you want impact, you need to collaborate. No one organization can really do this work. And there were so many people, not only in Canada, but around the world, who were engaged in this, that we needed to tap into their collective wisdom to really have impact. And so it, from our perspective, this was well worth the time and effort moving forward. So yes, we needed to focus on the system. We know in patient safety, this is not just about tweaking around the edges, although that's important, and local level is really important, but we need to come at this from a system perspective. So all of those things were important, so that was lessons learned to keep going. But what we also learned through this is that we need to build capability in our system that we assume that all of us have the knowledge and skills around patient safety. We assume that. I will tell you, when I graduated, which was a really long time ago, from nursing, we didn't talk about patient safety. We were only starting to talk about quality assurance. And those of you, I have PTSD from the, those days. I mean, you just remember the, that nurse coming with the clipboard and ordering everybody around, and it was like audits. It wasn't, we weren't really improving what we were doing. We were just chicken, checking boxes. And so we knew that for many people in our healthcare system, and, and even today, we don't see a huge curriculum focus on patient safety, although we're working with all of the schools to really try to enhance that so people understand what their competencies are that they need. So we needed to look on around the capability building and we had to understand people's competing priorities. As a leader in an organization, and all of you are leaders or you wouldn't be here, you know the multitude of competing priorities that come across your desk every single day. And although I don't think there would be one of you who wouldn't say patient safety is important, sometimes it doesn't bubble itself to the top because you assume others are taking care of that. So we had to understand that in the work that we were doing and the people who we were working with. That purposeful consultation and engagement, everybody has a story to tell, everybody has input into this work, and it's all of our responsibility and job to move this forward. And, you know, don't try to recreate the wheel. There are lots of networks and alliances that are out there. Tap into them, utilize those that are there, because that really made our work so much easier when we did that and we recognized people for what we did. We want to make it easy to do the right thing. And often we complicate things so much in healthcare, so incredibly that it's really difficult for people to do the right thing. And we learned that through the way. How do we make this easy? How do we make it simple in the work that we're doing? Measurement is critically important. If we don't measure it, it's really difficult for us to know where we started and how we improve it. So we knew that that was something. And of course, should go without saying, but we say it over and over again, that what was critical for our success was that patients and families were engaged every step along the way in this work. Uh, just some um, <clears throat> quotes from people who were engaged when we did our evaluation and interviewed a number of stakeholders of what they saw was important in moving forward. And some of the recommendations that came out of our external evaluation around this, um, this consortium. So overall, huge success. That was what we got from the um, evaluation, but also as you can see there, there were some recommendations for us to do that. So one thing to develop the actions, and we're famous for this in, in 
health care, right? We do amazing work. There's a, a, a amazing ingenuity in health care. It's why we get things done, because we figure it out. We learn to do new things around there. But when we, when we hit on something really great, our spread and scale is abysmal in this country, truly abysmal. And so we work with our partners at CFHI and others who really are working on the spread and scale of things as we bring these new ideas forward. How can we start to embed them and share them, even within organizations, let alone across provinces and around, around the world? Um, there were some enablers that we needed to address in a little more robust fashion. So leadership, which is why we created the leadership bundle. We needed to bring leaders into the tent so that they were aware they have huge responsibility around the patient safety and quality agenda in their organization. So what is their role? How can they move that forward? What are the tools? How do we measure it? How do we report on these kinds of things going forward? Very critical for us to work with the provinces and territories at the, at the government level to start to embed this work into policy, into regulation, into accreditation standards, those kinds of things. So we, we do need a stick. It's not all about stick, right? We want to get people engaged. We want them to be doing the right things. But sometimes we do need to embed this. And so that was a lesson and a recommendation um, coming from, uh, from this and around making patient safety a priority. Because at the time that we were doing this consortium work, the burning platform of patient safety had diminished significantly in this country. We weren't seeing the same kind of leadership at a federal level. We weren't seeing the same kind of leadership at provincial levels. And there was so much churn and change happening in the healthcare system right across this country that it was not at the top of people's agenda. And so what we heard from our stakeholders and those engaged in this work is please make this a priority. It has to be. So, so what did we do with all of this? In 2018, we put a bow on the consortium. We had asked people to sign on for five years. There was tremendous momentum. People were excited about it, but that wanes over time. And so what we said was, you know, let's go out on a high note with this, but we can't just let everything sit that happened. We need to be sure that there's a legacy for this work, and how do we start to embed it in the everyday work of our organization at CPSI and others? And so as um, you know, fate would have it, we were in the process of developing a brand new strategic plan at CPSI. And so we took a lot of our learnings from this work. We took what we heard from people across the country who were engaged in this work, and some who weren't, but who said to, who were real gurus in patient safety and said, we need to do some things differently. And so what we did is we took that and this informed what our strategy was going forward for the next five years at, at CPSI. Our um, tagline, patient safety, right now. Not in six months, not in six years, right now. We, cannot, we can no longer say it's okay, right? Any social movement that's happened in this country or anywhere around the world was because people realized what was happening and sat up and said, it's no longer okay. It's not acceptable. And when I talk to you a little bit about the statistics around patient safety, you, I think you will feel the same thing. So our vision statement, which usually makes people's eyes roll, you know, when you're saying you're going to be the best of anything in the world, they say seriously get a life. But we think that we can have the safest healthcare system in the world. You know, our healthcare, although we're a big country, we're small. Everyone, we know each other right across this country. We're all engaged in the work that's happening. Um, our, our, our Ministers and our deputy ministers meet on a regular basis. For the first time at the G20 summit, patient safety is an agenda item. We're seeing that it's being raised and people are really interested in it. So we believe that those OECD standings of, of Canada down in 9 and 10, that we can, maybe not be number one in my lifetime, but we certainly should be consistently moving up that bar. Our mission statement, what's important in this is the word sustained. That's what we heard in our evaluation. That's what we learned in the consortium. Please just don't do something and then go on to the next thing. And that we're, we're, we're famous for this in healthcare. We don't evaluate and we don't sustain. We keep moving on as leadership changes, as governments change, we go to the next thing. This is about sustained improvement in healthcare. And our strategy is about demonstrating what works and strengthening commitment. <coughs> Excuse me. So 
I'll just flip by that. We have four lines of business. I'm not going to go into all of these, but one, I, a couple I do want to point out for you. One is that we are strengthening our muscle around the policy, regulatory, accreditation side of things so that we are working with regulators. We're working with policymakers. We have a policy um, advisory committee at CPSI. We bring together assistant deputy ministers from across this country on a quarterly basis at their request because they didn't even know who their counterparts were across this country. They don't know what they don't know about patient safety and they're hugely interested in that. So we're working with them on that. We're working in very close partnership with Health Standards Organization and Accreditation Canada. And I'll speak a bit about that. And the other one that I wanted to highlight here is making patient safety a priority because we switched gears. For most of the work of CPSI, we have worked hospital-based with care providers at the front line, trying to change them. Right? trying to give them the tools and resources to provide safe care. And that is really important work and we will continue to do that. But what we realized is that patients and the public, the public don't know, right? The public don't have, they have go blindly into organizations. We wouldn't buy a house, we wouldn't buy a car, we wouldn't get married we would, without test driving at all, right? We would not do that. But in healthcare, we just walk blindly in and we assume that we are gonna be well cared for. We don't even think about the fact that there may be unsafe care. When I first came to CPSI and my father asked me what this new job was I was doing, my father turned 90 last year, he's my benchmark, right? I, he, I, I go to him to, to stay real and stay connected. And so I told him about why, and he said, well, why would they have an organization like that? And I told him about, you know, care being unsafe, and he is a significant user of the healthcare system. And he said, what do you mean care is unsafe? Like, seriously? What, what do you mean? He had no idea that things could happen in the healthcare system. And so one thing that, so we have a huge public facing campaign, not to frighten people, not to frighten them at all, because we want them to have faith in the healthcare system because you're doing amazing work, but it's just to raise their awareness so that they can have the tools to be equal partners in their care and they can work with you to keep themselves safe in the healthcare system because we know nobody intentionally harms patients moving forward. We, what we did is we worked with IPSAs to do um, a poll of the Canadian public just to get a sense because our premise was people really, unless they've been harmed by the healthcare system, they really wouldn't know. But, so, but we wanted to validate that, to see if that was true. So we did a poll with IPSAs of a few thousand Canadian people. It was stratified, it was all statistically significant. And what we learned is that was the premise was correct, that people really didn't know that care was unsafe. And when they were given a series of things to say, what do you think is a priority in the healthcare system, patient safety being one of them, there were a series of things they could list. What do you think they thought was the number one priority in healthcare? Access. Access, number one priority. What they read about on the front page of the paper or what they experience every day is what the priority was for them. Access, second most important, was still access really, but to long-term care, right? What they read about in the paper, that's what the public gloms onto. No patient safety was down at the very bottom. As the survey went on, it started to tell people about what was happening in the patient safety world, how many times people were harmed, how many times people died, et cetera, in the healthcare system, and they came back to that question at the end. And where do you think patient safety rated as the most important thing in the healthcare system at the end? Number one, once people were aware, once people were aware of what needed, what was happening in the healthcare system, it became a priority for them. So we knew there was an appetite, and once they were educated about things, how interested they were to move forward. So why is it that we're so passionate about this work um, now and going forward into the future? What, what are the statistics around patient safety? Why should we even be concerned about this? We should be concerned about this. So this is work that we did around hospital harm with, uh, with Kai Hai. There have been two reports that have come out and they haven't changed over the time span that this work has come out. That, and this is based on hospitalized patients, so we realize we're leaving out a huge portion of people in home care and long-term care and primary care, but this is where we have data. 
Kai Hai has data. So this is hospital-based. It does not include Quebec statistics, and it does not include uh, psychiatric inpatient facilities. And so with that proviso, we see that one in 18 hospital stays results in unintended harm moving forward. And many of those folks who have been harmed are harmed more than once in the healthcare system. And this data remains the same. You may recall a couple months ago, OECD reported on OECD countries across the, around the world world. And Canada fared much better on the quality indicators than we had in the past, but on the patient safety indicators, we were below the, the average on four out of five. And look at some of these. So two times more likely to experience tears during childbirth than um, our OECD countries. The, in 553 foreign bodies left in people after surgery. 14% increase since this was reported last. This is a never event in our country. This should never happen. There are lots of checks and balances to make sure that this doesn't happen. And yet we're going in the other direction on this. Two times more likely to, de to develop a blood clot after hip or knee surgery. My husband had his hip replaced in the fall of this year and his sister-in-law had her hip replaced three weeks before and so I was talking about his recovery and the fact that you know I had to dust off my nursing skills to give him his injection of heparin every day for two weeks and she said, what are you talking about, injection? And I said, well, were you not put on an anticoagulant after your surgery? And she said, no. And so we have best practices, we have standard guidelines in all of our organizations around this, yet physicians opt out. And these, this is the consequence of some of that work. So we know that we have work to do. And if that wasn't scary enough for us, we worked with a firm called Risk Analytica a couple years ago because we wanted to be able to quantify why we should invest in patient safety in this country when we're talking to politicians and bureaucrats and, and leaders of healthcare organizations. And what we found when the information was combined from um, home care and hospital-based care, that patient safety in death from a patient safety incident that shouldn't have happened, preventable, was third, the leading cause of death only behind cancer and heart disease in this country. The United States has replicated that as well. They have published around this. Every 13 minutes and 14 seconds, somebody dies in our healthcare system from a patient safety incident that could have been prevented. Every minute and 18 seconds, we unintentionally harm somebody. That, in any industry, would be unacceptable. It sure as heck should be unacceptable in ours, where our patients are entrusted to us and they believe we're going to provide great care. You saw some of these statistics in the, in the video, so I won't, won't go over them, but they are pretty significant, and they should be wake-up calls for all of us. This is why we do what we do. These are some of our members of Patients for Patient Safety Canada who came together at a face-to-face -face meeting um, just before Christmas in Winnipeg. We do this every two years, have a face-to-face -face meeting with them. And these are the people who have been harmed, just a snippet of the people who have been unintentionally harmed by our healthcare system and are working with us to make it safer. Just quickly, I know I'm running out of time. Um, some of the other work that we have done, we have, because uh, we recognize that we don't have a framework for quality and safety in this country, we have worked with the Health Standards Organization and have developed this framework. It's not, um, not been published yet, but it's out there for consultation. Many of the provinces and territories are mapping their work to this and utilizing it already. So we're really excited about where to go. So what can you do? What can all of us, I'm not asking you in your jaw, in your current role in your organization, but you as a person around patient safety. This is our new campaign that's targeted to the public and it's called Conquer Silence. Every one of us has a story. Either we have a personal story or we know of something that we were involved in or that happened to a neighbor or a family member around the healthcare system. This is not about shaming. It's not about blaming. It's about learning. And it's, it's almost cathartic for people. And every time we talk about this, people kind of line up afterwards and tell me their story. Say, you, you, just, you, you, know, you won't believe what happened. And so we have um, an opportunity for you to go online at CPSI 
to tell your story anonymously, what you've learned from that. Any recommendations you have to people. We're mining that information so that we can learn about this. Tell your story. Speak up. If something doesn't feel right, if it doesn't look right, if it doesn't seem right to you, it isn't. So speak up. And it's hard for us often to find our voice with healthcare providers. There is a power dynamic, whether it's intentional or not. People feel vulnerable when they're in the healthcare system. They don't want to complain. They don't want to say anything. We've been there ourselves. How many of you ask your doctor if they've washed their hands before they touch you? Not many of us, right? Some of, I even have a hard time. I do it in a joking way, but I, ha I feel like I have to do it because I work at CPSI. But it's, <laughs> it's intimidating, right? It is. You just kind of feel intimidated about that. So it's just those kinds of things. How do we find our voice? It is about conquering silence. That's what's going to change patient safety. When we say it's not good enough, it's not acceptable that every 13 minutes and 14 seconds somebody dies in our healthcare system. Simply not acceptable. So speak up, find your voice, tell your loved ones, tell your story, and together we are going to be the safest healthcare system in this world. So I'm going to thank you. I went way over time, but I think we still have a time for a few questions. <coughs> So yes, we do have some time for some questions, so if anybody has any questions, let me know. Okay, well, I'll get us started. Uh, There's one back there. Was it, okay. There's one back there. But as I'm walking back there, I'm just I'm curious myself, you said one, eight, one in 18 um, people to visit a hospital are, are harmed. What is the minimum standard for being harmed? So I want to tell you a quick story about that. So um, some of you may know of CHEO, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario. They were, uh, the CEO and a number of folks were sitting around their table, most their, they had a, a quality committee, and they were debating the issue about what would be the rate of harm that we would find acceptable in our organization. And so they were throwing out 5%, 10%, you know, looking at what it was now, trying to bring it down. And after, um, Alex Munter, who's the CEO, let them go on for about 10 minutes, and finally he said to them, I'm going to ask you a question. How many children is it all right for us to kill? And there was dead silence in the room, and um, he said, zero is the rate of harm we're striving for. So we know that we'll probably never get there. We're human beings. Errors happen. So the rate of error may be different. The rate of harm should be zero. That's what we should be getting to. So that there we are. Thank you for your presentation. It was great. I'm just curious uh, what, what, if anything, CPSI is doing in the medical schools. I mean, this is a system where the inmates run the asylum. <coughs> and if you can't get to the clinicians early yes. in their training um, to make them aware of, of the risks, yeah. Uh, then, then it seems to me that we're sort of barking up the wrong tree in many respects. So I'm interested yeah. in your views on that. Absolutely. So we've been working very um, diligently with the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons over a number of years on what are the competencies that um, medical students need to have around patient safety and it is now embedded in the CanMeds curr curriculum. So all 17 medical schools across this country teach patient safety competencies embedded right in there. So they learn about it in their undergraduate training. Uh, we are working with the College of Family Physicians and the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons around a number of education programs for those who are teaching quality and safety or are teaching residents. In, uh, in the um, hospital setting or community setting or wherever to give them the competencies and the skills. And we've, so we, we've done a lot of work, probably the most work with our physician community on that. And just in the um, last couple of years have worked with the schools of nursing, the university schools of nursing across this country to do the same thing, to embed in their curriculum. Pharmacy does it. We're working with the uh, paramedics. So just trying one by one to go through because your point is absolutely essential. However, what I will say is when they get out to work, if it's not supported, if they don't see it, it can quickly fall off. So we need to, we need to come at the, it's a system issue, right? But we are coming at it at every direction that we can. 
Hi, Chris. Hi. Thanks very much for a great presentation. Um, I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit on what opportunities you see for learning from the airlines industry. I, I know it's often held up as the standard. One of the things that impresses me about what they do is they have an independent investigative body yes. that investigates safety breaches, essentially, and then makes recommendations that basically are forced upon every airline globally <laughs> to follow. And with formalized procedures that back them up. So I'm wondering if you see any sort of parallels or things that Canada could leverage from that kind of a model. Yeah, so absolutely. We've, uh, we've learned tons of lessons from the aviation industry and in fact have worked with CAE, which is, uh, does simulation around, uh, <clears throat> around aviation. So we've, we've learned and we've incorporated many of the learnings. The difference people will say is, you know, in aviation, the pilot and the flight attendants have a vested interest, right, in getting to the ground safely because it, it, it's different. It, there is a difference, right? A bit of a difference, but we can learn a ton from them. We also have studied the nuclear industry. So patient sa the whole literature around patient safety has examined all those high reliability organizations, what makes them safe. And so they, they aren't completely comparable, but the lessons we can learn from them are tremendous and they are embedded in a lot of the check, all a lot of the things we do in patient safety, the checklists, the, those kinds of things, but, um, but we can continue to learn from them. The difference in aviation is every time, and, and you know, I, I was on a committee one time with a pilot for, a test pilot for Boeing, they were testing, and he said in our little committee, every time he flies, and this was a veteran flyer, he had fly, flown planes in the armed forces in the States, and he was a veteran, he said, every time I fly, I had to have an error. Every time, whether I'm, you know, b below altitude I should be, whether I don't do something, every single time. They have an obligation when they land, first thing they do is they go report, anonymously, but they report. And all that information of all those near misses or all those errors are taken up and put into the simulation that pilots are required to do on an annual basis, right? They factor that right in. That's our issue, a big issue for us in healthcare because we don't have robust reporting systems. If we do, often, if, it, if any of you are putting in a report, sometimes you never see it again. You don't know what happens with that. You don't know if there are learnings that come out of that. We don't share it across the country. We don't even share it across units sometimes. So there are tons and tons of examples um, and learnings that we continue to take and try to embed in the work that we're doing in patient safety around those high reliability organizations. Uh, so we have time for one more question. Does anybody have a question? Other than that, then thank you very much to Chris Powell. Pleasure. Thank you.